so great to be here. And, well, Father, thank you. We just ask you to um, just bless your word, Lord, and encourage us the second half. We just uh, thank you for giving us a kingdom that's unshakable. And we just seek first the kingdom of God. This is our our calling to um, to look at things with eyes of faith and not to walk by sight. And we just thank you for all the blessings that we we find within the veil, Lord, and that um, even though you call us outside the camp, we we have you with us, Lord, and um, and this life is so rewarding. So we just ask you to uh, bless this second half, Lord. Please breathe upon your word. Breathe upon our ears, our hearts, as we just mix faith with the promises and and um, we continue to pursue you. We want to hold on, we want to draw near, and we want to go forward in the second half. So just bless this class, we pray in Jesus' precious name, amen. Okay, let's open to, um, to Hebrews chapter 10. And this will be a little bit of uh, background. Uh, next week we're gonna have an introduction to the book of Hebrews, but. Um, I've always found this chapter very helpful. Just uh, when and when we consider the title Hebrews, it um, is really pointing towards the audience who the writer is speaking to, and these were Jewish Christians. These were Christians that um, were experiencing uh, persecution, and that's what this chapter um, sort of brings out for us. Uh, I was thinking about the messages recently that Pastor Shal has been preaching on, on the second coming, and uh, and this promise that Jesus Christ gave to his disciples that uh, fear not, little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, and just in light of what we just heard about uh, uh, Enoch walking with God and and uh, God rewarding him. I think this is one of our rewards as believers, that we are part of his kingdom, and it's in the mystery form. It's something that, um, in one sense, we you look at the church and you don't see much. You sort of see uh, a, a battered people, uh, the off-scouring of the earth in one sense, but, but inwardly, because of the the Holy of Holies, and because of Christ, and our hearts are sort of uh, bowed the knee to him, we have the smile on our face, because really there's a kingdom that's coming, and there's a kingdom actually that's here now, and a um, beautiful verse in chapter 12, it's, it's after this severe warning, and there are these five warnings in the book of Hebrews, but after each one, there's like this uh, promise of like uh, an incredible encouragement and sort of confidence that what the writer and the, the speaker of this book is saying to them, he says, I know that this is not really speaking of you, and there's always an encouraging word. But this verse is verse 28, and it says, actually, um, Hebrews 12, 28, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom, which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. And I love this because in the original language, it's talking about, it, and this is a good translation in New King James, since we are receiving, it's something that we're on a daily basis. It's a future reality. It's a the heavenly hope. It's, a, 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 it's something that, we're, we're always looking forward to, and the kingdom of God will come, and we will be a part of it. But even now, we're a part of this. And, and because of this, we, we don't have to fear. And uh, we've rec we're receiving a kingdom. And we know that this world, this, this is, we're sojourners, we're pilgrims here. And this is really what the book of Hebrews is it keeps bringing to our attention. So back in chapter 10, uh, there's a 
starting in verse um, verse 32. This is an amazing portion. It gives a little bit of the background of what's going to be happening in the book. But recall the former days in which you were illuminated. You endure, endured a great struggle with sufferings. So the writer is calling them to look back. In this passage, we're going to see a looking back and a looking forward. When they were illuminated, this is speaking about the light of God. Salvation is like an enlightening. They, they received the Lord. And, and at the same t- time, they endured a great struggle. And I would say that a theme of all of the, the five books that we'll be studying this semester is endurance. This is a word that um, hupomone, we usually think of the word patience, and maybe even in your translation it might say that. But this is such an important uh, word, and actually this passage is an encouragement to endure, and this is the calling that we have. This is why we press on, because even though there's a great struggle, and this is a contest, this is an athletic word, it's sufferings, and it's sort of like the, the call of God often leads us as believers. We're illuminated, we're, we're experiencing the Lord, but we find ourselves in a battle, and where all of a sudden it's almost like the stage has become a gymnasium for our faith, and it's horrible what we're experiencing, but We need to recall the former days. And he says in verse 33, partly while you are made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. So we see some of the persecution was directly related to them. Um, He mentions in verse 34 what happened um, to, and then there was also body members, maybe that they were the targets. It says, for you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. So the writer's saying that um, he had experienced, um, he was in chains The moment I read that, I think of the Apostle Paul, but I don't think he was the writer of this book. That's my personal conviction. He could have been, and we'll talk about that in the future. But these people had endured, and they they had suffered themselves, but then they were also very compassionate to others who were suffering, and they joyfully accepted the plundering of their goods. And this is that's such a mystery. This is the Christian life that we could be losing earthly possessions. They could actually, um, our, our world can be shaken. And this is what happens. So much of what can be shaken will be shaken. And God is in the shaking business. And, and what happens is first we're like, um, but then there's this amazing joy. We realize that we start looking forward to enduring possessions that we have ourselves in heaven. I found, I've realized this, that so much of our life on in this life of faith is, it's really, um, it's, it's considering the eternal realities. It's looking to Christ. It's realizing that we're seated above. It's, it's realizing our, that heaven is our home and, and this is what they were doing. Look at verse 35. Do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance. Now the King James says patience, but this is the word endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. So this is the the general uh, direction in the, in the book of Hebrews, and I would say also... Um, here on this is what we're going to be learning this semester that um, Jesus Christ the focus the life of faith hope and love uh, this this trinity of God's virtues and we have um, in the last part of Hebrews we have both faith hope and love all three of them perseverance is the word I wanted to speak on 
Growth is what God is after. He's after us becoming like Jesus Christ, but perseverance. So what does this word mean? Um, Hopomone is the word for patience and the word for endurance here. And basically it means to stand your ground. It's to remain on the field of battle, not to flee. So here we're in this great contest and it's very difficult and Persevering means that we continue to try to do something during difficulties and we are like runners and God is calling us, I really believe this, he's calling us to be like marathon runners. That our life as believers, it's, we could be sprinters, meaning that we could like go at things with, uh, with a lot of adrenaline and, and zeal and, and then find ourselves as we have exerted all our energy just to fall down after going the distance that we were going. But God calls us to be marathon runners, which means that there's this long obedience, a long obedience in the right direction. I love that phrase. And think about this. There's a, it's a lifetime it starts when, when we accepted Christ, but it's continuing. And with all of the difficulties, with all that God allows, with all the things that are shaking in our life, we're, we're latching on to the promise and we're walking by faith. And, and it's so important. And I think the natural tendency when we're, persecution comes, is to cast away our confidence. That word confidence speaks of boldness. This is that free speech. This is the, the, the heart that is like speaking, moving freely with confidence, and that so easily can be uh, forsaken. But... The writer's saying, don't cast it away because there's great reward for you have need of endurance. So after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. So um, what we're going to see in the weeks to come in, in the case of the believers in the book of Hebrews is there's tendency to draw back. There's suffering, persecution, there's opposition, and the writer's saying, go without the camp within the veil, but, um, but they're, they're sort of, their hands are hanging down, they're weak, their knees are weak, and there's this danger of um, not entering the rest, drawing back. Um, we're going to see in the book of Hebrews, the, wo the wilderness generation are going to be examples that... Um, they're, they're like the worst example you could follow. There's the Hebrews 11 faith folks that are, are enduring and continuing, and even though they don't receive the promise, they're pressing on towards maturity, but then there's those that are drawing back. And um, I would say, uh, this is my personal testimony, one of the saddest realities in this life as believers is the fact that um, believers, some believers don't, don't continue. Um, something happens, there's, a, there's an offense, there's, they're wounded, they're, um, the pastor says something, the, the church and, and the devil's behind it and, they're, and they draw back and they, they end up wandering, wandering in the wilderness, and they're not hearing the voice of God. Unbelief comes, maybe rebellion comes, and um, and then this this issue of apostasy is something that that's handled head on in the book of Hebrews. But I would say that um, the false teachers that Jude and Second Peter talk about. Um, the false doctrine that they're bringing. There's, there's a group of teachers who are like heretics, and not only heretics, but then there are also apostatizers. So um, this is a subject that I think is uh, really very important for us as believers to understand 
what apostasy is. How does it happen? Is it possible for believers, true believers in Christ, to apostatize? And then there's backsliding, and we all know backsliding. We all know what it means to, to come to a place where it's very difficult to go forward. And Pastor Stevens used to talk about a term called retrogression. Retrogression means like walking backwards. It's returning to an earlier, inferior condition. It's sort of saying that, oh, if I just don't go soul winning, then I won't be persecuted, and maybe I won't go soul winning. And, um, and this, this tendency to like stop going to church, and I want you to do something as homework. This is going to, uh, one of the, one of the uh, things that I regret is not having numbers on these pages. But if you look in your workbook after the last reading assignment, which is on Second Peter, so it's about halfway through. This is right before the overhead projection part of the workbook. The last part of the workbook are all these overheads. Um, the ones that we have in class tonight aren't, aren't on there, I don't think. I think it starts with Hebrews. But anyways, I'd like you to familiarize yourself with the workbook. But I'd like you to look at, and as a homework assignment, there's this page that talks about first century Christians context exercise, it says. Do you see that? And what this is, this is, I took this from a commentary on Hebrews. It was by this gentleman, his name is um, Lane. And it's a fictional account of a gentleman who's living, I believe it's in Rome, a young man, I think he got saved when he was 17. I don't know how old he is. But it's talking about his situation and his life. And it's, it's fiction. But when I read this, it sort of just, and I really believe that God calls us to have like a, a baptized imagination. And this helps us to understand the context. So they put this gentleman in a situation. And I would like you to read this for next week's class. So mark it. You might have to turn the page over because so you find it. And then next week we can talk about it. Um, but he's, in this story, he's stopping going to church. He's having problems, problems with poverty, problems with his boss, and most of all with his family, who, uh, because he became a believer, he was a Jewish gentleman. They have sort of had a funeral for him, disowned him. He's thinking about what it was like growing up and going to temple feasts. And he's seeing his friends and family going to the temple. And here he is, a believer in Christ. And all of these horrible things are happening to him. And he's wondering, why, what, what would happen if I went back? What, if, what would happen if I didn't like, publicly proclaim Jesus Christ as the Messiah? What would happen if I just started going back into the temple and... And, uh, and this is what's happening in the book of Hebrews. But the, so the writer is saying, don't, don't um, cast away your confidence. This is a gift from God. This zeal, this boldness, this, this assurance that we have. This is what it means to be a believer. And it would be so easy to cast it away. And you, in chapter 11... A good example of this is Moses, and it says of Moses in verse um, uh, 25, look at 11.25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin. Wow. So Moses chose it, and this is what we choose also. We say it is an honor to suffer with Christ. It's an honor to bear his reproach. Jesus Christ is the most amazing example of endurance. Look, look at what he, as our master, had to endure. At the, and, um, and Moses also, and look at verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked 
for the reward. That's amazing. And this is, this is sort of what we do as believers. We're looking for the reward. And Pastor Shell has been talking about the kingdom. And we're, as Bible college students, we're seeking first the kingdom. We know that everything's going to be added to us. We don't see it. It's in a mystery form, but we know that we're part of a kingdom. And Jesus said he was going to give, give it to us. He's coming back. So we're getting ready. We're sort of like servants, and we're readying ourselves for his coming. And even though it's late at night and the tendency is for us to fall asleep and we have our lamps burning and we're watching and we're waiting, all that we have is the word. The word that says that he's returning. This is what the writer says in chapter 10. If we go back there, he says, For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. And if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. So this is amazing because um, when you, again, you look at this in the original language, what he's doing is he's quoting from Habakkuk chapter 2. And this is a very famous statement, the just shall live by faith. And it's amazing because when you read it in our Bible, in the Masoretic version, um, when you read this prophecy, we see that it's all about the vision, the vision that the prophet is receiving. And in our Bible, it says, though it tarry, wait for it. So he's waiting to get the vision. He's waiting to get the word from God, the oracle, and then he's going to run with it. But in the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament, what the writer does, for whatever reason, it's not the vision that they're waiting for, but it's a person. And the person is the Messiah. If he is late, wait for him. It's the deliverer. So what we see, and this is one of the things that we learned from reading these, the book of Hebrews, is the way that they translate scriptures, the way, and what the writer is doing here, he's talking about receiving the reward, receiving the promise, not casting away your confidence, for Christ is coming, for yet a little while he who is coming and will come and will not tarry. So then he quotes there Isaiah, I believe it's 26. He sort of adds a little phrase in there. But it's about Christ. It's about the Messiah. And, and, and this is why we don't draw back, because our, our eyes are on the reality of the coming one. And this, I believe that this would be another title of Christ in this passage from the Old Testament and it's the coming one. Christ is the coming one. And uh, in closing, I was uh, just hearing the messages that uh, Pastor Shell has been given and thinking about the kingdom. And I was thinking about First um, Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, For you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, a special people, his own people. And I was thinking of, in one sense, the mystery form of the kingdom of heaven on earth is seen in the body of Christ. And, and what, what are we doing? We're, we're waiting for him. We're waiting for the, the cry. We're waiting for the call. And when Jesus talked about it in the, in the New Testament in, in Luke 12, that, that, that's an awesome passage because it says that the master is away. He's at a wedding feast and the servants are home and they're, they have their lamps lit and they're waiting and they're watching and they're, it's very late and they have a tendency to sleep, but, but their eyes are so much on the coming one. And then when he comes, Jesus kept, keeps saying, blessed are they whom the master finds waiting. And, and then it's a miracle verse in Luke chapter 12, because verse 36 and 37, it says when the master comes and they're waiting there, the, the natural tendency is for us as believers is to like get down on our knees and start taking off the master's coat and serving him. But Jesus says, you know what's going to happen? When I come back, 
I'm going to gird myself. I'm going to put on a servant's cloth. I'm going to get down, and I'm going to serve you. And this is just miraculous. This is like our this kind of leaders that Jesus Christ exemplified is this amazing servant. I'm sure it's like Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Peter's saying, this can't be. You, this is wrong. This is wrong. And this is how we'll be also when Christ comes back. But this is the heart of our master. He serves us. He washes our feet. And, and I, I was just reading in, in John chapter 21 that Amazing story. They're back fishing again, not catching anything. Jesus is on the shore. They don't know it's the Lord. Have you caught anything? No, Lord, we haven't caught anything. Cast your net on the right-hand side, starboard. So they do it. And all of a sudden, it's the miracle of the fish. It's the looking on the shore. It's John saying it's the Lord. And it's Peter just taking off what he was wearing, the cloak, and swimming towards Jesus as fast as he can. And this is sort of like us waiting for the coming one. When we hear, when we see, and, and whatever it takes just to be with him and just to embrace him. And then what does Jesus say when they get there? He says, come and have breakfast. <laughs> come and have breakfast. It's, I've made it for you. I've, I'm going to serve you. There's, there's fish, and this is just the kind of Lord that we serve. And this is why we endure, and this is why we don't cast away our confidence, because um, there's an amazing reward, and the reward is the Lord. The Lord is our great reward. Genesis 15.1, fear not, Abraham, I will be your shield. I will be your great reward. Amen. Father, thank you. Thank you for, uh, even though this life of faith, persecution, and all that we go through, that you allow, Lord, um, we're so shaken sometimes, but we just thank you for the reality of, um, of your coming, your reward, your service, Lord. Thank you for the gift of patience, Lord. We have need of patience. And, and I just pray for each student as they serve you in Bible college that you would bless their, um, their endurance, that you would just give them the grace to, to make it and to um, bless us as we go home now tonight. Thank you for just encouraging us with these words from Hebrews. Bless us as we come back next week. We commit this class to you now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.